The aircraft carrier USS Hornet, CV-12, is an interesting case. A ship as famous, if not more so depending on the person, for her peacetime service as much as her combat career. She had long and successful service against Japan, but she also had a major role in the space race, most notably recovering the crew of Apollo 11. Mind you, she might also be better known as one of the most haunted ships currently afloat. Regardless of how much you believe in the spooky times, it's why I chose to cover her this close to Halloween. To me, it seemed thematically appropriate. In any event, this video will focus on Hornet's service history. The details of her design can wait for a video on Essex. A fair warning though before I move on. This is definitely going to be on the longer end for one of my videos. As for Hornet, her life began on August 3rd, 1942. On that day, USS Kearsar CV-12 was laid down by Newport News Shipbuilding in, surprise, Newport News, Virginia. Her construction at that point continued much as any other Essex. At a quick pace, with a sudden need for a lot of carriers, very quickly. Where things changed compared to others was in the sinking of USS Hornet CV-8. This came in late October 1942, with the result that Kearsarge would be renamed on the stocks. The incomplete carrier took on the name of the lost Doolittle Raider, becoming Hornet CV-12. This is likely because the previous Hornet had also been built by Newport News although I'm admittedly unaware of any letter asking the Navy to let the shipyard build a new Hornet, like had happened with Four River after the sinking of USS Lexington CV-2. Regardless, with her new name, Hornet would be launched on August 30th, 1943, just a little over a year after being laid down, which is a sign of just how fast American shipbuilding was ramping up. Her commissioning would follow on November 29, 1943, continuing the fast pace of progress. Things would, of course, slow down a little when it came to sea trials. These were required to test the ship and her crew, and ensure they were both ready for action. It is also a good time to talk the basic technical details. With a length of 872 feet, 265 meters, and a full load displacement of just under 37,000 tons, Hornet was substantially larger than her namesake. That hull was pushed through the water at 33 knots by 150,000 shaft horsepower through four shafts. As for weaponry, as designed, Hornet carried 12 of the excellent 5-inch 38 caliber gun, eight and four twin mounts with two on either end of her island superstructure and the remaining four mounted in a gun gallery on the port side of the flight deck, with the result that she could have a 12-gun broadside over the port side and a still effective 8-gun broadside over the starboard. As for her light anti-aircraft weaponry, that would change across her career, but it began with 32 of the ubiquitous 40mm Bofors gun and 8 quadruple mounts. These were scattered around the hull, and supported by 46 20mm cannon, similarly spread around the deck. Hornet wouldn't see much change during the war, though, because she spent basically her entire wartime career on the front line. Of course, all of this would be a moot point if Hornet didn't have aircraft, and that was where the Essex class truly excelled, being capable of carrying over 100 aircraft. Ranging from the F4F Wildcat, to the SBD Dauntless, and on to the TBF Avenger. And the replacements for the Wildcat and Dauntless, in the form of the excellent F6F Hellcat and F4U Corsair, along with the rather less spectacular Curtis Helldiver. Perhaps fortunately from the perspective of her pilots, Hornet would follow the usual theme of late war American air groups, going all in on fighter bombers, while gradually reducing the number of more traditional dive and torpedo bombers. With those details out of the way, Hornet spent her shakedown crews and initial training in the Caribbean, 
lasting until February 1944. At that point, it was off to the Pacific to join the buildup of the Fast Carrier Task Force. However, it would be some time yet before Hornet faced the foe that had sunk her namesake. The Japanese Navy of 1944 was very much not the Japanese Navy of 1942. As such, Hornet's initial wartime service, after arriving in the Marshall Islands, would see her join Task Force 58. Alongside her sisters Lexington and Bunker Hill, Hornet operated in support of operations in the Palau Islands. The carrier aviators claimed nearly 200 aircraft between aerial kills and ground targets. During this, the Avengers would drop mines, a first for carrier aviation, to bottle up Japanese forces. Meanwhile, Hornet, as flagship of Task Group 58.1, would continue offensive actions. Supported by three Independence-class light carriers, Cowpens, Bellow Wood, and Baton, she set sail for New Guinea. While this was supporting amphibious landings, Hornet would prove to have little to do. The Japanese put up very little resistance, and the carriers eventually left after a few days. When this was done, Hornet anchored for resupply on May 4th. During this resupply and rest process, her initial combat captain was replaced. Considering that man was Miles Browning, who you may remember from the video on Juno's sinking, this isn't surprising. He was an abrasive and arrogant sort at the best of times, who had made multiple mistakes during his time in command. In any case, Browning was out on May 29th, and Hornet was back to sea in early June 1944. First to bombard truck, sometimes called Japan's Pearl Harbor. By this point in the war, the Japanese had largely given up that anchorage. It was, after all, attacked quite often. Hornet simply joined the fun, as it were. Following that, it was time to support the Marianas campaign. She was joined in this by her sister and fellow renamed carrier, USS Yorktown CV-10. This ship had replaced Cowpens, forming a more cohesive two-fleet, two-light carrier formation for Task Group 58.1. With this new formation, the Americans set out again. On June 11, 1944, her planes and pilots were raiding Tinian and Saipan. The next day they were back at it, only this time over Guam. With no time to rest, Hornet moved further afield and proceeded to attack Iwo and Chiichijima on June 15th and June 16th. She may not have been getting into a pitched fleet battle yet, but Hornet's pilots were putting in good work. Unfortunately, while generally quite successful against land targets and enemy aircraft, her fighter bombers proved less effective on moving ships. This is an expected result in a lot of ways, because attacking ships at sea is the kind of dedicated training the men probably didn't have. It did mean, however, that the American fighter bombers failed to stop a seven-ship reinforcement convoy. The Japanese reached Guam in spite of attempts at stopping them. Throughout all of this, the Japanese were initially hesitant to respond. While theoretically capable of mustering a strong force to fight back, they were reluctant to commit to anything. Understandably so, considering the situation. The Imperial Japanese Navy, by this point, was reliant on poorly trained and inexperienced pilots. The corps of veteran and highly skilled pilots that had rampaged across the Pacific was largely spent. Even so, when the American fast battleships bombarded Saipan, it became apparent that this wasn't a raid and that the United States Navy intended to stay. With this in mind, a massive counterstrike was planned. The Japanese would throw basically everything they had left at the American fleet in another attempt at a decisive battle. The resulting engagement, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, has had rivers of ink spilled over it. After all, who, if you studied history at all, hasn't heard the phrase, Mariana's turkey shoot? Hornet would be one of many American flattops involved in this battle. Her planes joined in the action on June 19th, hitting the land-based Japanese aircraft 
and reinforcing the combat air patrol over the fleet. Multiple waves of Japanese aircraft, both land and sea-based, attempted to batter their way through the American defenses. In this, they largely failed. Some attacks were made on various ships, but no major damage was done. For her part, Hornet's pilots got action during the first, third, and fourth waves. During the second wave, Hornet was busy recovering her aircraft, as well as rearming and refueling them. That said, Hornet's crew did well here. Exactly how well is difficult to be sure, with the massive number of Japanese losses. 200 or so planes from just the aircraft carriers. I've seen anywhere from 20 to 50 kills bandied about for Hornet, in specific. No matter which kills came from which carriers, though, this battle gutted Japan's carrier force. They lost almost every aircraft committed to the battle, along with three aircraft carriers. The effective light carrier, Hiyo, the Pearl Harbor veteran, Shokaku, and the newest and greatest Japanese aircraft carrier, Taiho. On top of all these other losses, Hornet's pilots badly damaged Zuikaku, the last of the Pearl Harbor attack force. Unfortunately for the Americans, since the final attack was launched very late in the day, they would suffer multiple losses in planes and pilots. Not to enemy action, but to failures to return to their ships. In fact, more planes were lost in a failure to return than the Japanese had shot down which is probably telling when you think about it. The reign of the Zero was over, and the age of the Hellcat had begun. Admiral Ozawa's own report indicated the Japanese were down to 35 aircraft between their surviving carriers. As for Hornet, after a set of follow-up attacks on the Bonin Islands, she returned to Eniwetok on August 9th, 1944. By this point, aside from a short break prior to the turkey shoot, Hornet had been operating non-stop since she arrived in the combat theater. And it would be quite some time yet before she returned home. Places like Eniwetok, forward operating bases, were the best the carrier got. Luckily for her pilots, they would often transfer out and be replaced by new men and new aircraft. Not so for the carrier herself. At the end of August, Task Force 58, including Hornet, became Task Force 38 as Admiral Halsey took command. For those unaware, this wasn't really a change in ships or formations. When Spruance was in charge, it was 5th Fleet. When Halsey was in charge, it was 3rd Fleet. This change in command didn't impact Hornet much, at least at first. The overall commander of Task Force 38 remained Mark Mitcher, who continued much as he had under Spruance. Incidentally, Mitcher had previously captained USS Hornet CV-8. There's a quote I've seen to the effect of, My girl returned to me, or some such, in relation to CV-12. However, I've never been able to find the exact quote, or the source, so take that with a grain of salt although I do know that Mitcher was attached to CV-8. In any case, questionable quotes aside, Hornet's next major task would be supporting the liberation of the Philippines. This required more raids on Japanese holdings, which is fairly stereotypical work, as late war American carriers go. First was another strike on the Palau's, along with the Carolines. Then attacks on the Philippines themselves, specifically Mindanao and Leyte, on September 12th and 13th, 1944. The Japanese provided little in the way of defense against any of these attacks, as Hellcats and Corsairs dominated the skies. Mind you, it was about this point that overclaiming kills began to get a tad silly. American pilots claimed something like 500 planes destroyed between aerial kills and ground attacks. The Japanese only had 176 aircraft in the central Philippines. And while they certainly did lose planes, it wasn't all of them. This would continue later in the month with a further claim of 110 aircraft shot down, 
and 95 destroyed on the ground. I would like to think the Japanese wished they had over 700 aircraft in the area. Various Japanese ships were also destroyed during this period, from an old destroyer, Satsuki, to multiple oil tankers and other auxiliaries. However, by the end of September, Hornet was in need of resupply, so she returned to safer waters to do just that. Upon conclusion of this task, Hornet was back to work, this time sailing further and further from safe waters, first to the Ryukyu Islands, Okinawa and such, and then on to Formosa. That is, Taiwan, to use a more current name. The attacks on Formosa came on October 12, 1944, through October 14. This saw further savaging of Japanese aviation, but it wasn't without losses on the American side. USS Canberra and USS Houston both ate torpedoes during this process. Canberra, in fact, was hit by a torpedo aimed at Hornet that the carrier had evaded. Oops. That said, an interesting coincidence here is that both of those ships were named for losses from earlier in the war, much as Hornet herself. Canberra for the Australian heavy cruiser of the same name, and Houston for an American heavy cruiser. As for Hornet, she evaded any damage in turn through skillful ship handling and her experienced pilots and gunners. With the attack on Formosa done, Hornet's task group returned to the area around Luzon. More raids were launched on Japanese airfields in preparation for the landings on Leyte. Hornet's pilots would also be called in on more direct supports of the landing beaches. This took place from October 20th through the 21st, with her planes hitting the beaches and the immediate surroundings. However, by this point, the carrier had expended a lot of her supplies, and her pilots really needed a break. As such, on October 22, 1944, Hornet and her task group were set to return to Ulithi, only for Halsey to order them right back around for his own decisive battle with the remnants of Japanese carrier aviation. I think the fact that Admiral Izawa's motley mix of ships being a decoy is fairly well known at this point. Nonetheless, in going after those ships, in addition to being well on her way to resupply anyway, Hornet was out of position to help the Taffies against the center force on October 25th. This didn't stop the carriers from attempting to hound the retreating Japanese forces anyway. Aircraft from Hornet and Cowpens would sink the light cruiser Noshiro in this process. Unfortunately for the Americans, the real prizes, that being the battleships, escaped without further damage. With Karita's escape, Hornet and her group turned around, again, and continued to Ulithi as they had planned. While there, Mitcher moved up, and Admiral John McCain took his place in charge of Task Force 38. Hornet returned to the Philippines and various strike missions in November 1944. Her planes would help sink several Japanese destroyers and cruisers, along with about every kind of auxiliary under the sun with the Japanese Navy no longer capable of offensive action to any practical extent, this was all Hornet had to do. That being said, kamikazes were starting to become a real threat. Multiple aircraft carriers had been hit, and a couple lighter ones sunk. Because of this, the Navy did two things. First, they continued the practice of putting a gun on every open space. Secondly, they reorganized air wings again. Dive bombers and torpedo bombers were cut down further, with a full three-quarters of an Essex-class air wing consisting of fighter bombers. It's a good thing they didn't need a big strike package by this point of the war. While this was being done, Hornet was assigned to attack airfields on Mindoro. This should have been a simple task, but then Typhoon Cobra struck on December 17, 1944. Hornet actually escaped relatively undamaged this time, though the same couldn't be said for other ships and aircraft. Repairs to damage and resupply efforts would see Hornet miss combat again until 1945. In January, the fast carrier struck out into the South China Sea. 
Over the course of the month, Hornet and her companions would sink around 300,000 tons of shipping. In exchange for fairly heavy losses of 200 aircraft in turn. After that, Spruins took command once again. As part of Task Force 58, Hornet attacked mainland Japan in February 1945, including Tokyo itself, in an ironic mirror of what the previous Hornet had done as part of the Doolittle Raid. After that, it was on to Iwo Jima where she supported landing operations on February 19th. Hornet's rapid pace of operations would continue for the remainder of early 1945. She would attack Japan again during March 1945. Hornet evaded damage in the Japanese counterattacks, although other ships, most notably USS Franklin, were rather less fortunate. After the American forces withdrew to safety, the undamaged ships would move on to Okinawa on March 23rd, which, while successful in interdicting the island, saw more and more kamikaze attacks. Hornet continued to evade damage, while all around her, ships and men burned and died. It was her luck in evading damage that saw Hornet join with the other undamaged carriers to attack the Japanese Navy at sea one final time. This was Operation Tengo, which saw the Yamato, and most of her escorts, sunk by American aviation. With the Imperial Navy even more of a wreck than it had already been, Hornet attacked the Japanese home islands once again. By this point, the fast carriers were exhausted, and Hornet's group returned to Ulithi for rest and refit on April 27th, 1945. They returned to Okinawa following this, and continued to support operations there. Until, that is, Halsey took command again in late May. The ultimate result of this was, in June 1945, sailing into a second typhoon. Hornet's luck finally ran out, with the storm-driven seas wrecking her bow. As you can see on screen, this wasn't a small amount of damage, either. Similar damage was done to her sister ship, Bennington, while USS Pittsburgh continued the fine tradition of American cruisers losing their bows. Because the United States Navy wasn't going to let something as silly as a wrecked bow stop combat operations, Hornet proceeded to continue on, steaming backwards to launch aircraft over her stern. That was something American carriers were designed to do, although it was very rare for that to be necessary. For reference, the Typhoon struck on June 5th. Hornet was only detached for repairs on June 13th. This saw her return to the West Coast, arriving in San Francisco by July 7th. The first time that Hornet had returned home since she first left, back in early 1944. By this point, the war was largely over, and Hornet's repairs would keep her in dock until September 13th, 1945. With Japan having surrendered during her dry dock period, Hornet's final mission in her first bout of service was Operation Magic Carpet, where she helped ferry troops home. It was during this period that another famous picture was taken, seeing Hornet with her namesake sister, USS Enterprise, as well as USS Saratoga, the oldest surviving fleet carrier. Over the course of the war, Hornet claimed nearly 1,500 aircraft, between aerial combat and ground targets. She also claimed over 1 million tons of enemy shipping, sunk or damaged. This is almost certainly overclaimed, but even a fraction of that remains impressive. In any event, with the war over, Hornet was considered largely surplus to requirements. The swarm of Essex-class carriers had newer long-hold models, and the Midways were coming online as well. Hornet, as one of the first of her class, was decommissioned and put in reserve in January 1947. She remained there until March 20th, 1951, as the Korean War raged on. At that point, Hornet was recommissioned, long enough to sail for the New York Naval Shipyard, where she was decommissioned again on May 12th for the relatively modest SCB-27A conversion into an attack carrier. 
This still took until September 11th, 1953, which kept Hornet from participating in the Korean War. Indeed, she would largely spend the 1950s on typical peacetime duties. She sailed from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean, with the only real excitement coming in two areas of Asia. First, on July 25th, 1954, when Hornet supported her sister Philippine Sea in contesting communist Chinese aircraft after they shot down a British passenger plane. Then, in 1955, Hornet helped cover anti-communist Vietnamese evacuations from the north to the south of that country. These incidents aside, the 1950s were a quiet time. Hornet went into refit on December 10, 1955, for her angled flight deck and related modernizations. The SCB-125 upgrade in this case. When that was complete, she joined the 7th Fleet in the Far East, where the carrier would spend much of her remaining service history, most of which spent on training duty as she became progressively more obsolete in the jet age, to the point that, in 1958, Hornet was converted to a dedicated anti-submarine warfare carrier. With the new designation of CVS-12, the aging carrier continued on her training duties, with the exception, that is, of three combat tours off Vietnam. October 1965 through January 1966 for the first one. The second tour lasted from May 1967 through October of the same year. Her final combat deployment came in November 1968 and lasted until April 1969. None of these deployments to Vietnam saw much combat. Hornet, as an ASW carrier, was largely used for search and rescue and escorting the carriers doing the actual combat operations. This isn't to say her planes and pilots were never used in combat, but they weren't intended for that role by that point. All that said, Hornet had a more lasting legacy from the 1960s, and that was supporting the space race, particularly the Apollo missions. First, in August 1966, she recovered an unmanned test module. That was recovered and is currently on display with the USS Hornet Museum. After that, on July 24, 1969, Hornet would pluck the Apollo 11 astronauts from the water after they touched down. Although the men moved from one type metal box into another, as they were quarantined in a modified mobile home aboard the carrier. I'm sure that Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, and Neil Armstrong enjoyed that a lot. But then again, no one knew exactly what going to the moon and back would mean for contagious diseases back then. Can't fault them for being careful. In any event, Hornet would also recover Apollo 12 on November 24, 1969. This would prove to be her last task in active service. Increasingly outdated as she was, Hornet was decommissioned for a final time on June 26, 1970, at which point she was mothballed in Bremerton, Washington, until 1989. In recognition of her service in the Second World War and the space race, and Vietnam as quiet as that was, Hornet was made a National Historic Landmark in 1991. This saved her from the scrapyard as she was made a museum in 1998. The USS Hornet Museum opened its doors in Alameda, California on October 17, 1998, where she has remained ever since. Hornet has been a popular filming location for various movies and television shows, in addition to hosting Carrier Con. A good portion of those TV shows, incidentally, focused on her supposed hauntings. Ghost sailors, lights turning on and off, things moving without anyone touching them, all your usual hallmarks of ghost stories. How much you believe those tales will, of course, vary between different people. Regardless, Hornet has certainly earned her reputation as the most haunted ship in America. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.